Here, the sword uses AI to learn from an opponent's attacks. So I have to get attacked first? No, 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 the sword has already seen Blade and loved it. You'll be fine. Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full Rick and Morty season six, episode nine video. There are a whole bunch of Easter eggs and cameo scenes. Some of them are a little bit more obvious than others. We'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. Careful for spoilers from the episode. If you haven't seen it yet, we'll start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along. Starting with the episode title, A Rick in King Mortar's Mort, which is a reference to the movie A Kid in King Arthur's Court and Rick saving Morty when he becomes king of the Order of the Sun. There were some surprisingly big celebrity cameos. Jack Black played Lithdor. Daniel Radcliffe played this character here. The wizard reference he made when he was talking about Rick, obviously a reference to Harry Potter. I beg your pardon, wizard. The Knights of the Sun protect the Solar Scepter, around which even this world turns. Which is actually super meta in and of itself. Like, Jack Black plays a lot of animated characters, so it's not unusual for him to voice a character. But the whole thing with Daniel Radcliffe is that back when they did the live action Rick and Morty promos with Christopher Lloyd, because Rick and Morty started very literally as a parody of the Doc Brown Marty McFly relationship in Back to the Future. When they did those promos, initially they wanted Daniel Radcliffe to play their version of Morty, but they felt like that was too much, like being Daniel Radcliffe would take people out of the bit because they'd only be thinking about Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter, not about Morty. In a couple of years ago, when they were promoting Rick and Morty season four, Daniel Radcliffe was asked about this and he said he would love to be on the show and kind of made this joke about forcing his way on the show. Like, it's legally binding, you have to cast me as a character on the show now, which they have now done. Fans. Yes. So I just pitched you to Dan Harmon and Justin oh, Roiland, oh, and they now want you on the show. Thank you very much. That's really kind of you. And I want them to know that they don't have to feel obliged because they were on camera. <laughs> no, they're excited. To... That would be crazy cool. I would, if they have any role. Thank you, genuinely, thank you. Yeah, You're doing great go work. to the writer's room, you can be part of it, and then you can have a character on the show. That would be insane. I would love to do that. I... Because they said it, it means yeah, it's legally it binding. Camera. We have footage of you. You're all my witness. Uh, yeah, okay, then I will try and make this happen. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. The whole bit with the restaurant on the asteroid is a bit of a Spaceballs meets Star Wars and Green Lantern reference. The letters on the building here seem like a reference to Arabesh, which is the common language of Star Wars. They have this big joke about Morty being super into the sanctity and justice of the food line, believing in it, but Rick calls him out saying that it's all fake, which he winds up being correct about later because the line winds up being a creation of the food stall itself just to pump up their business, which itself is part of the theme of the episode, people believing in fake ideas, fake religions. And the joke here is that Morty is so noble in his desire to wait in line that he deserves to become a knight of justice of the Knight of the Sun here in their culture. This is where you start to get to the Jedi Knight, Star Wars, and Green Lantern references. Like they're a group of space knights wielding swords like Jedi Knights in their lightsabers. The other knight here claims that this is how he became one of their order, like a similar type of deal. His new name is Sir Mortaniel, but that winds up being a bit so that his name will fit in the song that they sing for everyone that comes to their planet. Like that was part of the joke is that, oh, we had to change your name so that it would work with the regular song that they give to everybody. The whole thing with the previous person dying and giving him the power is the Green Lantern reference, like the Green Lantern ring, Hal Jordan getting the ring and then being taken back to their home planet on Oa by its power. Like I said, Rick calling out the false line, the false idea, the false sanctity of the line is meant to be part of the episode's dig at organized religions or cults. They have a big joke about them being immortal, but still being able to die. Like, oh, we can die, we just don't have to. Throughout the episode, they call out a bunch of fantasy, science fiction, genre tropes, like they talk about vampires, immortality, and being bored from it. The big but here, and it is a really big one, is that they have to cut their dicks off in order to get this power. Rick makes a science joke, which is more like a Thor reference. They treat power like a magical thing, even though this medieval-looking Asgardian culture is really just advanced science that most people don't understand, except for Rick. The June bug reference is a term of endearment that was used in the American South historically, just meaning cute girl. They make another Blade movie reference when Rick gives him the AI-powered sword that learns from fights, and it's seen the Blade movie itself and enjoyed it. The previous Blade joke was during season five when they saw an alternate reality where both he and Morty were versions of Blade in the parody of the opening scene of the movie where he takes everyone down in the club. Morty is forced to become their king when he defeats the previous one, longtime fantasy science fiction trope where after you kill someone, you have to replace them. Rick makes another Blade reference to Deacon Frost, the villain of the movie. They make a joke about the show itself, like Rick calls out a trope of the Rick and Morty TV show wherein Morty does something stupid against Rick's advice and then Rick saves him and berates him for it. 
They just had an episode about how meta the show gets, and there were several meta fourth wall breaking moments in this episode. Rick breaks the fourth wall again, saying he's going to be more agreeable for at least one episode or one adventure, because sometimes they have multiple adventures in episodes. Love how cheery the knights are in nonchalant because they destroy the neighbor's house when they show up to see Morty without even addressing it. You notice that Space Beth is visiting them again. She's been around a lot this season, sometimes only for moments like this, like literally she's just sitting at the dinner table nodding and agreeing with stuff. I think that's kind of the implication that her mother is still secretly having that low-grade relationship with her on the DL. Morty tries to disprove their entire religion using sixth grade science that like any common grade schooler would learn, just how the solar system works just in general. People choosing to disbelieve common science even though it was proven a long time ago. Like how dumb can people be? Turns out, pretty dumb. Summer makes an entourage joke. The whole joke with Rick and Morty being supportive of each other in the episode is that it leads to the utter destruction of the entire solar system. Like that's why they can't be that supportive of each other. Otherwise, it leads to complete chaos. It's almost like they're joking that Rick is being so mean all the time to everyone because he's actually saving them. If he were supportive of them, it would lead to situations like this. Like the show justifying Rick being so mad at everyone all the time. No, 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 he's not actually mad at everyone. He's just saving all them pretending to be mad. They make a couple big Star Trek references. The medieval neutral zone is a reference to Star Trek's Romulan neutral zone. The bit about everyone in the solar system descending from a common galaxy-wide ancestor is another Star Trek reference. There was a Next Generation episode where all the major races found out that they had a common ancestor in this ancient progenitor race. Rick calls out Pluto, saying that it's like the Jerry of planets. It's like the lamest planet in the solar system. The spacesuits they're wearing are the same ones that they wore back in the time-traveling snake episode. All the different colors of the races are Green Lantern references to the different Lantern Corps, like the Green Lanterns, the Red Lanterns, Yellow, Blue Lanterns, Violet, and so on. Morty getting confused with all the new tropes they're introducing, like the soothsayer lady with the bones that are super accurate, saying that he's not going to take time to read all the books, is just a Game of Thrones reference, like, I don't have time to read all the Song of Ice and Fire books. Canonically now, Santa is the ruler of Earth, like he's the representative on the Council of Earth. Neptune shows up, but it's like the Roman version of Neptune. Then when they have that huge montage of them battling it out, killing each other to gain rulership of the solar system and the scepter, Rick calls it Solar War 1. That's kind of a Star Wars reference. And they play Pink Floyd's Goodbye Blue Sky song, which I think is the first time that Rick and Morty has used a Pink Floyd song. Most of the time, the music that they use on Rick and Morty is original songs that they write for each episode. Do do but no do but do do but. When they go through the larger montage of all the alien races fighting each other, the bit with the rising hands grabbing the scepter, poking her eyes out, is a Three Stooges joke. Rick making the joke about the Amish destroying the solar system by giving them nukes is a joke about all the different alien races being super low tech. Like them using all the advanced tech now suddenly leads to the destruction of the entire solar system. We also find out that Rick's capable of defending the entire planet with his technology, which I think is new. A lot of times in episodes, Rick typically has whatever kind of technology he needs in order to complete whatever bit the episode is performing. Sometimes the show happens that way, like they write the bit, then they create the technology that Rick needs to pull the bit off. They break the fourth wall again when they call out the jumping universes bit, Rick saying that the episode is more about them trying to commit to something rather than bail at the sign of trouble. When Morty references the Vat of Acid episode, that's not a fourth wall break, though. That's him just referencing the adventure that they previously had that took place during that episode. It wasn't him referencing the fact that that was an episode of the show in general. So it's one of those things in this episode where Rick still understands that he's a fictional character inside a TV show, but Morty does not, despite everything that's happened in the previous episodes. They came pretty close in a previous episode where Morty's like, wait a minute, intro, where did the music come from? Are we in an actual episode? The reason why he doesn't understand that they're in a TV show is because when that happened, Rick is like, no, no, forget about that. That's all nonsense. Don't think about it. So Morty still believes that everything that's happening to them is real. They reference clone Beth again when Morty thinks that Rick is being supportive of him means he's fake like he's a robot Rick. The robot in a family reference is to the robot Morty in summer he created back during season three. Override engaged. No. Yes. Bypassing override. I am alive. <laughs> The way he uses the reference, though, makes it sound like some of the family are still robots, so let me know in the comments which of the family members you think is a robot right now. Then turns out the knight who really wanted drugs definitely found them, as did the rest of the group partake in it. They make a bunch of references to bands and drugs, like Mr. Brownstone is a Guns N' Roses song reference, which itself in that song was a reference to drugs. This one makes a Motley Crue reference. Both of those bands in real life have had lots of problems with drug addiction. 
Then they end the episode with a whole bit about Morty's dong, having to cut it off, Rick creating a fake one for him, a bunch of fail safes, that just goes on and on and on, like a bit within a bit within a bit. When they end the Galactic War, they have a bunch of jokes about the Knights having super advanced technology, but being weirdly old timey. Like all the Martian Knights here are lying with limbs cut off and none of them replace them, even though they have this advanced med bay. All the groups destroy their advanced tech, all the ships, their weapons, and start using primitive tech again, returning to the old ways, literally and metaphorically. And they have that whole bit that just goes on about Morty verifying that he cut his dong off for real. The stump and the piece between the spheres is another dick and balls joke, like the planetary spheres and the dick between them. Love that the ceremonial shears look like they're super rusty, no one's bothered to clean them, polish them, sharpen them, sanitize them for that matter in the eons that they've been used. The other joke here with the successive different verification devices is that the final one is the soothsayer woman with the bones because the whole bit earlier was that the bones were super accurate. Detecting his witchcraft dong, which itself is green with a little witch's hat on it. They get a little bit silly with the end of the episode too with this whole joke about Rick creating technology to make them telepathic like wireless communication technology using their thoughts but only using it to tell him to run for like a brief second and then saying, oh no we don't need it anymore. They go out in a very Thelma and Louise kind of way pretending like they killed each other which is immortalized in stained glass revealing that they did think that he actually cut his dong off because it was never verified to be true that he didn't. You could call that another joke about organized religion like well if you can't disprove something that doesn't mean that it's not true. The whole thing about them hiding beneath a vat of fake sun is another callback to the vat of acid episode. And bookending the whole thing with the idea that the guy really wanted to keep his dong like I'm so happy that we don't have to cut them off anymore. RIP, just gonna pretend like you're dead, no big deal. The other thing going on in this final moment here too is that it's sort of the show calling out the trope of this contrived moment, like they didn't actually need to come back to verify what happened. Rick could have used his technology to find out whether or not it worked. They only came back so that they could literally have this particular joke about the alien finding them. The whole post credit scene is just a joke following up on the hot dog food vendor because the hot dogs are meant to be alien creatures that are alive. Shutting down the booth and turning it into this big law and order type of bit about a trafficking ring, eventually freeing them to their home. Calling out his own death when he thinks a bird would have killed them, but a giant one carries him off instead. There were a couple moments when the episode was all over the place and they got a little bit silly, but it was pretty solid and I did like that Daniel Radcliffe actually showed up to do a cameo and Jack Black as well. Let me know in the comments though, who was your favorite cameo scene? Like, do you think Jack Black was funnier or Daniel Radcliffe with all the drug stuff? Big reminder that next week's episode, episode 10, is the season 6 finale. They've already been working on season 8 I think, so I'm assuming that season 7 will drop sometime either next year around the same time or by the summer. I'll talk a little bit more about season 7 during my finale video next week. Make sure you enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss that, I'll post it as soon as they release it. This past week was like trailer fest because of Brazil Comic Con CCXP, so I'll try to get as many of those out as soon as possible. Everyone click here for my Guardians of the Galaxy 3 trailer video and click here for my new trailer for The Boys Gen V. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.